one of the best NFL betters. When he clicks, the market moves. Coming live from Germany, Mr. Suma, how's it going? Hey, Adam. Thanks for having me on again. How is it going in snowy Canada? It is minus 25 Celsius, which is which is nice and warm, to be quite honest, for what we've been facing the last four or five weeks. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody's missing anything not being out on the west coast of Canada. So nothing, yeah. nothing missing there. How is Divisional Weekend treating you so far? Oh, man, some really tight lines, some really disturbing early market moves early on the week that uh, I would say destroyed some of my tiny edges that are there in the divisional round. Um, we'll see how markets move. Um, only one bet in for me so far. So, yeah, probably another low volume week. I'm curious before we get to the bet. I saw, I think, the same reactions that you were seeing. You've been, what is this now for you? You're getting close to a decade or more doing this. Are you noticing the adjustments more recently this year last year, you have seasons this past when you were starting out uh, it's tough to say i would say that in general some numbers get bad and i would say smash into place earlier in the week than in years past that's something that i would um would say so for example i think especially last season there were a few mondays not every week for whatever reason there were a few mondays where some edges i would have had on on monday evening would get back would get bad into place um, very soon on monday that's something that's probably kind of new but um, in general yeah the market evolves um, more smart money into the market i think that's what we are all realizing yeah it's and just the general, like the not as like there's always an element where it's going to be priced in more and more each year, but it's almost like those numbers that I think a lot of us were waiting on just never, never mind getting bet quickly, it just never existed, especially in the case of some of the Sunday games. But, um, into the bet that you've made, curious, what did you take and how are you feeling about it? Um, yeah, um, I took the Rams at plus three minus one fifteen, basically right before the show. Um, and yeah, so there are several reasons for that. So first of all, um, I don't want to overreact to the Rams' uh, performance on Monday night. I mean, they basically played a perfect game with a perfect game script. Um, Stafford didn't have to do much because they were leading early. And we're just basically cruising to victory. But I think what that game also showed us is that the Rams, um, this is a team with such a high floor. And I would guess that their ceiling is always defined by how many mistakes Matthew Stafford is making or is going to make in, a, in, in every single game. Um, but that team in general, the offense, the play calling, the playmakers on defense, several superstars, they, they always have that high floor. Um, so, and going into this week against the Buccaneers, first of all, it's not a tough spot for the Rams. The Bucs are at home, but um, they don't have a bye week. The game is not early, buddy clock time for the Rams. Um, the Rams are coming off two home games, so I don't think it's a very um, bad um, spot for the Rams to be in. And then matchup wise, I mean, the Tampa Buccaneers, I do I'm not as high on them as I were last year in the playoffs. Um, first of all, let's talk about their defense. Their defense is um, not as great against the run as they were last year. Um, last year, they were like the number one defense in the league against the run, shutting down every single run game that was out there. But this year, even though they are still somewhere borderline top 10, they are not as stellar against the run. And um, against the pass, they are also putting up some borderline top 10 efficiency numbers like 7th or 6th in EPA per play, um, a little bit lower in DVOA, which adjusts for schedule. And that's my argument here. The Bucks have played the easiest schedule of opposing offenses in the entire NFL. Um, in terms of DVOA, they have faced the 32nd ranked schedule, basically the easiest. Um, and they faced Dak Prescott in week one. 
I think, uh, met Stafford in week three and then Josh Allen in around week 13, 14 or something like that. So basically yep. only three solid quarterbacks all season long and they gave up 30, com uh, 30 points per average in those games. Um, their pass rush, Jason Pierre-Paul is not having a good season. Shaq Barrett is um, banged up. Their pass rush is not really on the same level as last year. And they are heavily dependent on getting to the quarterback via blitzes. Todd Bowles, there you see, is calling the highest blitz rate in the, in, uh, in the entire NFL at around 40%. And when the Bucks blitz, and this is from Sports Info Solutions, when the Bucks blitz at the highest rate in the league, they are creating pressure on 44.6% uh, um, of those dropbacks. Um, this is a very big rate. When they don't blitz, they're only creating 26.4%. We would expect huge drop off. Huge drop off. We would expect a drop off because with that sample size, um, it also makes sense for them to blitz a lot. Um, but that, that's a huge drop off. And now um, we are getting the Rams offense. And the Rams offense, I think if I was the defense, I would probably want to get pressure on Matthew Stafford without blitzing. Matthew Stafford has killed the blitz this season. He is averaging 0.52 EPA per pass against blitzes. Um, he is averaging 0.19 EPA per play or per pass when he's not getting pressured. So I wonder what the Bucks are going to do. Todd Bowles loves to blitz. Will he scale down his, his blitz rate against Matt Stafford? Because if they keep blitzing at this at this rate, I can see the Rams being very successful through the air. And if they don't blitz as frequently against the Rams, I'm not sure whether that pass rush can home consistently enough to really disrupt the Rams passing uh, passing game. I think as long as Matthew Stafford doesn't make these boneheaded mistakes, like throwing a pick six in his own red zone, I think the Rams offensively should be fine in this matchup. And then on the other side, yes. Well, I was going to say, like, there's always the difference between what we expect defensive or offensive coordinators to do and then what they're actually going to do. And it's kind of tough to discern. But when it comes to Todd Bowles, part of me feels like he doesn't know any other way to approach games than throwing as much blitz as he can, especially on late downs at the opponent. Like, it's just something that he always seems to do. So I think what you just said about Stafford, leading up to blitz and what that's going to open up. I think that's a very real possibility. Yes, absolutely. So I would not be surprised if we saw the same blitz, but I would also not be surprised if they say, okay, blitzing might not work as well against the Rams. We might scan it down a little bit, but yeah, in general, this doesn't sound like the greatest matchup for the Bucks defense to me. Um, Sean Murphy bunting was out with a hamstring injury last, last week. Don't know if he's going to play last week. The Buccaneers without him played with three safeties on the field all the time. I also don't think that you want to do that against the Rams offense. So I really think that the Rams offense should be fine in this matchup. Then on the other side, um, Tom Brady, the GOAT, yes, still having one of the greatest seasons you would ever expect from a 43-year-old quarterback. But they are without Chris Godwin, without Antonio Brown. And without Chris Godwin, they have played the Panthers twice, um, the New York Jets, and the Eagles last week who started the game basically for four or five drives with all their static zone coverage, spot drop coverage, and didn't make it hard on Tom Brady, and he, he was able to dink and dunk them basically to death. In the second half, they adjusted their defense a little bit, and soon they were able to make it a little bit harder on Tom Brady. Um, very much. Yeah. And very much, yeah. And... Now, all pro right tackle Tristan Wirfs don't know if he's going to play. So there's some potential injury upside there. And I just don't think that, that the Buccaneers offense without Chris Godwin and Tony Brown have been tested um, since Godwin went down against the Saints. Um, the Rams, they don't have the greatest defense, but they have, a, they have an incredible front. So without your all pro tackle, it's Juan Miller rushing against a backup tackle. Um, and Aaron Donald over the middle. I think those are really some mismatches that the Rams can exploit. Um, and then you, you can put Jalen Ramsey on either Rob Gronkowski or Mike Evans. And I think at that point, the Buccaneers um, offense might be a little bit limited. So yeah. I, I'm not saying that the Rams defense will be able to shut them down um, by no means. 
it's still Tom Brady in a very good offense, even though the, he doesn't have all the playmakers available. But I think that the Bucks might have a hard time on some of those drives. And w- when I put everything together, I like the matchup for the Rams um, offense. Um, I think the Bucks offense might be a little bit limited. So this leads me to believe that this is a very good matchup for the Rams. This could be a very tight game. I think the Rams really have a, a few matchup advantages here. And I would not be surprised if they pull the upset. Um, I basically like everything about that matchup. And yeah, I happily took the plus three today. I uh, was asking Rob on Monday when he was on the show, how much of a pass does Tom Brady get for being Tom Brady, despite when we're watching him in a playoff game against a very soft Eagles coverage, his receivers are clearly on a different page outside of Gronkowski and Evans. Yes. If that's any other quarterback, are we not just criticizing that to death this entire week? Oh, yes, um, absolutely. I mean, some of these plays... We don't always know whether it's a mis- whether it's a miscommunication, whether the receiver makes a false step. I think there were a few plays where Tom Brady had like an option route and expected his receivers to run further against man coverage or stop against zone coverage, and that didn't really seem to work out. And I just wonder now that they are facing the Rams' defense and Aaron Donald and Von Miller and all these press- press- pressure packages. I mean, then Tom Brady maybe needs to hold the ball a little bit more and needs to make more of those passes under pressure. And yeah, I just think that it could be a long day for the Bucks offense, to be honest. This was one of the games to me that stood out as we were talking at the start about just those adjustments happening before it was even like bets coming in. There were some soft, we'll call it books, offering Tampa Bay four, four and a half was kind of the general number at regulated U.S. books. Obviously, you're betting at places that accept much higher limits and have much more of an impact on the market. But were you surprised to see this adjusted down to basically a field goal off of that Rams win on Monday night, despite the Bucks looking very comfortable against a very bad Eagles team? I personally was not surprised because um, b- before the game happened, I said that as soon as I see a Rams plus three and a half or better next week, I would probably end up betting them. So um, I still thought that this is probably a field goal game before those matchups. So I was not surprised that the market immediately jumped on the Rams. I mean, they had a very great performance on Monday Night Football, May- maybe some a little bit of recency bias, um, but then also the injuries for the Bucs. Um, we saw even... even when the Bucks rolled the Eagles, I mean, it was n- not a performance where we say, "Oh, that was above our expectations." They right. still had, they still had some issues, like you have mentioned, um, with some of those passes, with some of those receivers that are not named Gronkowski and Mike Evans. Then now you might be without Tristan Wirfs, um, Ryan Jensen, the center. Got, I think he got a rolled ankle, might not be hundred um, percent, but yeah. There's definitely some injury downside for the Bucks, so I completely understood why the market would jump on them early. I think we can be quick on the other Sunday game. Anything there for you that is intriguing, or is this just a game that everyone I've spoke to this week is saying that it's kind of priced right on the number? Is that the way you're yeah. seeing it too? Yes, exactly. I think minus two and a half is a pretty good price. I cannot see that one going towards three. I think... Every three on the on the bills would get eaten immediately. But then on the other side, if you go towards minus one and a half, minus one, maybe pick him for the for the Chiefs, that would be vice versa on the other side. So I think two and a half is a pretty good number. I also think the total is a pretty good number. Um anything above um 54 makes sense to me. I think everything below 54 would be a would be worth a look towards the over. And in general. Um, the Bills' offense, they have been very inconsistent over the season. But if that offense, they don't even have to play as well as they did against the Pats. But if the offense is clicking and if, if Josh Allen is on a roll, I mean, any defense in the, in the league will have a lot of trouble um, de- defending that. And the Chiefs' defense, for as much praise as they got over the second half of the season... They've played a cupcake schedule and every time they faced a good quarterback or a good passing attack like Justin Herbert 
um, or Joe Burrow, um, they got shredded. And I would not be surprised if the Bills have a very good game offensively. Yeah, and then it depends on whether the Chiefs can score early this time. I mean, last week against the Steelers, against any other team, they're probably behind 17 in the, going yeah. to the second quarter. So um, I really think that the Chiefs um, need to score to keep pace. And that's why I would also have liked the over if um, if I could have gotten a, a, a lower number. I think both offenses um, will have a solid game and it might come down to the last last drive. Any thoughts on Saturday, either way with either game? Um, yeah. I, as we were speaking about Monday, um, Mon- Monday line movements, I think the line movement on the Titans was completely right. Um, I, I think some books even opened it at minus two and a half. Is, is that right? Overnight? It lasted, it lasted one open two and a half minus 20. It was there for, I think, 37 seconds. And then another one was two and a half as well. And it was, it was gone within minutes. So anyone that was less than a field goal just got taken immediately for whatever they were offering at the time. Yeah, it completely makes sense. I mean, divisional round um, home teams have been so dominant over the past decade. Um, 75% win rate, I think, winning by an average margin of almost six points per game at home in the divisional round. That bye week is massive. Um, the Titans have had two bye weeks in the last 10 weeks, whereas the Bengals had have, have been playing 10, 10 games in a row without having a bye week. Um, Titans are getting healthier. Julio Jones is healthy. Derrick Henry might be back and maybe get even up to 20 carries in this one. The Bengals are losing Buddy um, up front on their defensive interior. The Titans have a very good run blocking unit. And I think um, the Titans, what they want to do is they want to run the ball. They want to play play action off of it and hit the middle of the field with all these in-breaking routes. And the Bengals have been very vulnerable on those um, passes over the middle of the field. We talked about it uh, last week, I guess. And this seems like the perfect matchup for, the, for a very rested Titans um, offense. And then on the other side, the Bengals, low floor, high ceiling. I don't think they will be very successful running the ball uh, on the Titans. So it basically will come down on whether Joe Burrow is having a good day, whether it's clicking with his receivers. And I also think this game could be very interesting from a game script game script perspective because once the Titans are up multiple scores, it will be very hard for the Bengals to come back because they don't have a good offensive line. And if they are really forced to air it out, um, catching up to a lead against a Titans offense that can basically basically play up to their strength, it will be very hard for the Bengals. I have the vision of Darren Waller catching that ball on the final drive right up the seam off of Carr's play action. And I'm like, Tannehill can do that in this game. Probably any snap that he wants to draw it up, that's going to be there against this soft Bengals middle. And the Titans have yeah. a couple different options at tight end or within the slot. That it just seems like that's so exploitable. Yeah, completely agree. Three and a half too high, or do you think this keeps going? I I wonder if there's going to be Bengals money later in the week. Uh, for my taste, it's a little bit too high. I would have liked minus three. In this one, um, I, th- I think Rob made a good point today that the Titans don't have many blowouts on their on their resume. So they've played a lot, lot of close games um, this year, and they're also playing kind of slow and sometimes can invite opposing teams uh, back into the game. Um, so I would I would prefer the minus three here. Minus three and a half is a little bit too high for my taste. Anything in the late game, San Francisco Green Bay? Before we let you get back to it. Waiting for some injury news. I mean, Nick yep. Bosa was D- DNP yesterday. And I think um, so he has to progress throughout the five steps of the steps of the concussion protocol. He doesn't need to practice at all to get cleared by Saturday. But I think being DNP on a Tuesday when you want to play on Saturday, I don't think that doesn't sound really optimistic. But on the other side, he doesn't need to practice at all to be able to play on Saturday. So something something to monitor. I think that the Jimmy G injury, I think that narrative goes a little bit too far uh, because he was able to finish the game. 
Um, he was able to pump up the fa- pump up the fans with his arms after the game. He was limited on Tuesday. And the shoulder so, working well. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the shoulder. Was, I'm not, I'm not, a, I'm not a doctor by any means, but it didn't, it, it didn't really seem like that guy is playing on on last gas and might already um, might be close from falling apart. So, um, I just think that as long as he is able to practice, um, he should be good to go on on Saturday. Even though we still have to consider that he's a that he's got a thumb injury and a shoulder injury number getting out of control here at six, or is this just a combination of the home field, the bye week the weather Aaron Rodgers in a standalone playoff game, getting attention what's going on price wise here? I think everything comes together and I would not be surprised um, if that might get even higher than that a little bit higher than six if Nick Bosa is producing bad news today. Maybe Jimmy has another limited practice. Don't know how the markets will re- will react later today. I think everything comes together. But what's very interesting, Adam, is that you will re- remember in week three, I think it was Monday Night Football, Packers at San Francisco. The Packers had Jair Alexander. Uh, the Packers had Robert Tanyan um, at their disposal. And the Niners we're laying or we're closing minus three and a half at home. So it's a pretty, pretty drastic adjustments. I mean, a lot can happen over the course of the season, but I don't think that these both teams have, have changed so drastically that we can make such a big adjustment. In that game, the Niners um, um, weren't even at the point of uh, letting Debo Samuel run the ball. Debo Samuel started running the ball, I think, around week eight or nine. Mid-season, um, yeah. Yes, mid-season. Um, Trey Sermon was RB1. On the outside, we had guys like Josh Norman and um, the rookie Lenoir starting. Um, so it was minus three and a half for the Niners. And now we are looking at six. I mean, I get it's Lambeau, it's frozen tundra, it's it's cold. Jimmy, Jimmy G is banged up. But that might be a pretty drastic adjustment. I'm with you there for that, uh, for sure. But I think, like you said, it's probably, if you like San Francisco, a bit of a wait and see, especially with the injury yeah. news. No need to rush it. And and with everything that people are going to be hearing, that probably lends itself to people ultimately betting Green Bay. And we might see this number at worst hold, if not, maybe tick up a little bit. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Fantastic stuff as always at S U U M A eight one zero on Twitter. One of the must follows when it comes to betting on the NFL. Appreciate you sparing 20 minutes to jump on with us and enjoy the games this weekend.